Well, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to this uh, latest issue, uh, edition of uh, SCI's Public Evening Lectures, um, SciTalks, SciWebinars. Um, my name's Tim Reynolds, and I'm chair of the Public Evening Lecture Committee at uh, SCI. Um, and uh, I'm, it's my pleasure to be chairing this, uh, this session uh, today. Today, we're um, hopefully doing something a little bit different um, in that we're talking about um, public uh, communication of science and public engagement with science um, with uh, a, a two-hander, uh, Roger Highfield and Steve Scott. Um, assisting us today, I'm as the chairperson, is Paul Hernandez, who, uh, like myself, is also is a member of the SEI Early Careers Committee, um, who will be uh, handling uh, the Q&A side of things. Um, you can ask a question anytime during the uh, the talk, and at the end of the two talks, we'll be having a Q and A session. So please, if you want to ask a question anytime during the uh, the two presentations, um, just put it in the chat box. Uh, Paul will be collating those uh, questions, and we'll be putting them to uh, Roger and Steve uh, at the appropriate time. Our first speaker is someone, I guess, if you've ever read any science uh, communications in your, in your paper, you, you should know the name Roger Highfield. Uh, he's currently um, a science director at the Science Museum, um, but he's a journalist, has been a journalist, an author, uh, and uh, a bona fide uh, scientist, having, uh, during his postdoc, bounced um, neutrons off soap bubble, bubbles in uh, Lausanne. Um, but you may well know him best as uh, the science editor of the uh, Daily Telegraph, for just over two years, two decades, and also as his stint as a as editor of New Scientist uh, from 2008 to uh, 2011. He's written many books and uh, contributes to uh, articles to magazines uh, and uh, newspapers. Um, I was about to say all around the world, but I think that's pretty true, all around the world. Um, our second speaker is uh, Steve Scott, who is an engaged public uh, science engagement officer at um, a UKRI, um, and he's uh, been uh, involved with an awful lot of um, large-scale public engagement uh, programs with UKRI, uh, and previously at um, it, with Welcome the Genome Campus, uh, the Medical Research Council, and Sudler and Hennessy, and also at the University of Cambridge. So, with no further ado, I will hand over to Roger to uh, make the uh, first presentation. Thank you very much, Roger. Thank you, Tim. Lovely to be uh, here on the 140th anniversary of the Society for Chemical Industry. Let me just share my screen here to get things going. And um, there we go. So you might think actually it's a bit of a cheeky um, headline talking about um, engaging uh, with millions of people. But actually, in my old jobs, um, I did have to think about seven figure audiences. And today, with the Science Museum Group, we've got something like five and a half million visitors to our five museums in a normal year. And you can imagine we're putting on all sorts of exhibitions and galleries and events and so on. Uh, we look after seven million things, you know, from uh, spacecraft, Tim Peake spacecraft, to the sort of glass jar used to incubate Louise Brown. Uh, more than 40 years ago uh, to the archives of Babbage. And uh, one thing we discuss endlessly is how to engage the public with these objects and with the amazing stories um, that they tell. Now, of course, we, we always glibly say um, the public, but what do we mean by this exactly? And it sort of reminds me um, of, uh, and I'm still looking back in the mists of time at the Telegraph, where Margaret Thatcher said in 87 that there's no such thing as society. Uh, you know, she talked about how there's individual men and women and there are families, but you know, what is this thing we call society? And I think it's actually quite important to think about what do we mean by the public? Because engagement begins with the audience and your messages may differ in their impact and the way you craft them depending on that audience, you know? And when we talk about the public, do we mean adults? Do we mean children? Do we mean um, Piers Morgan? Um, do we mean you know, kids in some wretched urban estate? It's really important to have a clear picture 
of your audience. Um, now, of course, when it comes to newspapers, they've got a really defined audience, depending on their politics and whether they're broadsheet or tabloid. Uh, I worked for the, the Telegraph till 2008. I started off with a print readership of something like 2.2 million uh, people and covered tens of thousands of stories in, in, in that 20 years. Probably the biggest story of all was indeed climate change. And I can remember covering Jim Hansen's uh, Senate evidence that really drew attention to global warming. Um, and it really was a constant drumbeat through my time at the Telegraph, you know, whether it was uh, the plight of the planet or things like fusion power, which seems to be just around the corner uh, now, just as it was then back in 91 and the other many other times I, I wrote about it. And of course, you know, as time went by, we, we saw more and more evidence of the impact of climate change, for instance, with extreme weather events. I came across some promising wordsmiths as well, uh, who could really powerfully reach an audience. And I came across this young chap who wrote for the science page. I can't remember his name, but I, I do hope he's, he's thriving now. Um, and I have to say that uh, you know, back in 2008, when I left the Telegraph, it was obvious that we really needed to do something. And I'm still rather amazed that here we are approaching COP26, when uh, back at a big climate meeting in Toronto in 88, it must have been COP minus three or something. It was absolutely obvious that we, we had to do something. Anyway, over this time, you know, I worked on thousands of articles, scientists meet the media party competitions, uh, and also a few books too. Um, and these actually also, you have to obviously have an audience in mind. Uh, I've done eight books and co-authored a couple by the uh, bio, not co-authored, sorry, edited uh, a couple by the biotech uh, entrepreneur, Craig Venter. A couple were bestsellers, um, The Hour of Time and The Physics of Christmas. And I've just done one with Magda Zernika Gertz called The Dance of Life, working on another with my best-selling co-author Peter Coveney um, on efforts to simulate cells, organ systems, and bodies in exascale computers. Um, when it comes to reaching an audience when you're an author, I think what's the thing I've really noticed today compared with when I started writing books in the early 90s, or in the late 80s, was that um, publishers really want safe bets. They want authors who can bring an audience with them whether they've got a role in the media or whether they've got, um, you know, uh, a, a great uh, following in social media or whatever. So I've been at the Muse Science Museum for about a decade and that has presented all sorts of opportunities to engage with visitors across its five museums. And of course, you know, one of the people we work with a lot and almost the first thing I did was walk, work on a hawking exhibition. And I guess, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, Stephen Hawking, as the old joke goes, there's two kinds of pop science book. There's a brief history of time and there's all the rest. And Stephen was a phenomenon as a scientist, as a person, um, you know, and also as, a, as, a, as a, someone who could engage with absolutely massive audiences. And I remember seeing him in action in, in uh, 1988 in Berkeley, California, and his brief history of time uh, tour was amazed by the reception that he got, rock star reception. So it's been amazing to work with him over the years at the Science Museum. Obviously, he's no longer with us, but one of the things uh, I did to help engage with different sorts of audiences was to get uh, David Hockney to do an iPad portrait uh, of him. And actually, it's fitting that this year we've transferred the contents of his office including, you know, his reference library, his wheelchairs, comms equipment, and so on, memorabilia, Simpsons things, and, um, you know, stuff from Star Trek is joining our collection, and we've been digitizing uh, all this as well. Uh, and the museum offers all sorts of interesting ways to engage with audiences. So when it came to a mathematics gallery, um, we were very lucky to work with the star architect Zaha Hadid, I think on her own um, gallery project, where she actually, as a former mathematician, turned the whole gallery itself into a mathematical object built around this airplane and the flows of air around this airplane. Um, and I think it's been done a wonderful job 
in, in taking maths, making maths friendlier to broad audiences. Um, at the end of 2019, we opened uh, probably the world's biggest medicine galleries uh, in the first floor of the museum, based on the amazing collections of Henry Welcome. And again, art helped us to reach different audiences. Here, um, we've got uh, an amazing uh, bronze by Mark Quinn, the artist um, of uh, Zombie Boy, uh, a Canadian artist uh, and model who after a period of illness sort of covered himself from head to foot with, with tattoos and sort of turned himself into a living artwork. It's a stunning uh, way into the gallery and it's a stunning kind of conversation piece as well to get to engage audiences who wouldn't think about some of the aspects of things we're interested in. We can also directly engage with, with big audiences as well in the, in the museum. Um, you know, back in 2015, we celebrated the launch of Tim Peake's mission into space at the Science Museum. And in that single day, we had 11,000 visitors, 72 events. Uh, there were four cosmonauts there, including the great Alexei Leonov, uh, two live broadcasts, uh, by Stargazing Live with Brian Cox and the whole gang. And for me, the most epic moment was when 3,000 school children counted down uh, to Tim Peake's uh, Sawyer's blasting off from Baikonur. Incredible noise and an incredible event. And we also had some amazing hoopla as well on the 30th anniversary of the World Wide Web. Uh, we got Tim Berners-Lee's um, computer in the museum where the web was born with, with a wonderful label on it, do not power off. And I think the museum is a great convening place for uh, events, bringing lots of people to events, whether it's Tony Fauci on COVID uh, vaccines earlier this year, or a couple of years ago, bringing Bill Gates and Will I Am together to talk about the future technology. And there we found on Facebook Live, we got an audience of something like a third of a million people watching that event. So if you've got the right people in the right event, you can get amazing uh, audiences that way. Slightly madder project here with, with the great Alice Roberts. Uh, I challenged Alice to iron out the scars of human evolution for a new display. And, you know, she's talked a lot um, about what a hodgepodge of assembled parts the human body is. So we got her to design the perfect body. She came up with a wish list of modifications based on what she'd observed in the natural world. So she drew on the octopus anatomy for the eye, dogs for the plumbing of the heart because there's greater redundancy, and of course a marsupial pouch to deal with the large headed baby issue, ostrich legs and so on and so forth. And then we worked with this anatomical artist, Scott Eaton, and a, and a, a sculptor as well, Sangeet Probkar, to come up with this rather unsettling design of the perfect body, which starred in a BBC Four programme and went on display in, in the museum. Obviously, um, you know, a great way to reach a big audience and actually maybe undermine, um, undermine some of the slightly madder claims of creationism as well. Tim Peake's been a great friend of the museum and the group. Uh, we acquired Tim Peake Sawyer's spacecraft for the nation. You can actually see it on the ground floor of the Science Museum. And we toured his spacecraft with a virtual reality lounge, complete with, uh, with motion chairs and so on. And in fact, what was rather gratifying was that during its tour, it spent some time at Peterborough Cathedral and the church's visitor numbers rose by 800%. So you see, it, it shows you that science can reach audiences that religion struggles uh, to reach. But again, the power of having the right object in the right place at the right time with, it, with an interesting narrative, um, you can really um, you know, draw in very big audiences indeed. Just this year, um, we've been, of course, working up to COP26 with a series of climate talks. And I think something like, 25,000 people plus have seen this series of talks and we've had some incredible people uh, working with us. Uh, we've got Hannah Fry here, um, Jane Goodall, of course, but we've had many others as well, Partha Das Gupta, Tim Peake again, Kwasi Kwarteng, the minister, Helen Sharman, uh, you name it, something like 50 plus speakers investigating lots of different aspects of climate change um, and, and that's proved really successful way 
uh, to reach audiences. And probably one of the few silver linings of COVID is that it showed that we, we could put together events and pull in um, large audiences as well. And on a personal level uh, during COVID, um, I found it fascinating that um, we got very good response to sort of long form Q and A blogs that I wrote about COVID because um, we found that there was a real appetite for a deeper dive into the science. Uh, you know, as journalists, I think in general, did a fantastic job in popularizing this complicated subject for a big audience. I think it was so serious and it so overwhelmed people that they really wanted a deep dive. And some of these blogs were several thousand words long. And amazingly, we had a dwell time of half an hour uh, for the very first ones, which is sort of unprecedented, really. It meant people were really reading them and taking them in. So again, um, this is, um, you know, uh, another kind of lesson for engaging audiences. Salience is so important. Is it relevant? And of course, our efforts continue to engage audiences. Uh, we launched an exhibition about carbon capture called Our Future Planet. And if you see this slide, right at the back of the exhibition, you can see what looks like a concertina. That is a mechanical tree devised by Klaus Lackner at Arizona State University, a very innovative way to capture carbon. Although I have to say, when you go through the exhibition, the two things that become clear is, of course, we've got to cut carbon emissions. That's almost the first thing we say. And also there's no silver bullet out there, but we are in such a spot at the moment, we have to take these sorts of technologies quite seriously. Just a couple of days ago, we launched this beautiful exhibition, Amazonia, again, uh, looking at climate change through a different lens, uh, this time through a series of breathtaking 200 images of Amazonia by Sebastio Salgado. And then we uh, did an introductory video on tipping point science, really showing that the Amazon is not just aesthetic concerns that, that we wanna preserve this amazing ecosystem, actually through tipping point science, if we lose the Amazon and it could tip into Savannah in a few decades, it could have uh, shockwaves sent through the whole global um, ecosystem. And then a few days ago, we also launched Manchester in the Science Industry Museum, an amazing exhibition on uh, the latest in cancer research, where you've got really heartrending patient stories, amazing patient stories with the latest technology. It's not an easy subject to tackle, but I think my colleagues in Manchester did an utterly brilliant job. Obviously, when we um, uh, look at objects as well, in a museum, they do have a certain power, particular spacecraft, but you can, a lot of our objects, I say we've got 7 million, people just don't easily get to see. That's why our digitization program has been hugely uh, important to us. And now um, we're moving a whole load of objects from our st storehouse in West London to a giant new facility near Swindon. And we managed to digitize something like 300,000 objects. And this is really important for sharing with um, big audiences because you know now with the search bar, you can actually get access to uh, a lot of the amazing objects in the collection. And we get through our website something like uh, 11, 12 million visits a year. In fact, in 2015, I think the museum was declared by Google um, as the most Googled museum in the world. And I think the, you know, hopefully this mass digitization campaign will keep on um, growing audience numbers. So now I'm just going to drill down into one aspect of audience engagement, really to, to pave the way for, for Steve's talk, which is just to look a little bit at, at citizen science. Um, and of course, it sounds so obvious, but citizen science has to engage audiences too you know they've got to find it fun and interesting to do um and rewarding you know if you spend a hundred thousand quid on a citizen science experiment and only a hundred people do it i mean you'd engage more people if you had a wad of five pound notes and waved it at them and to encourage them to come in the science museum in exhibition road so i think it's quite important to set up citizen science um, experiments in the right way. So they work as much as for citizens as they do for scientists. And again, 
if there's one thing I want you to take away from this talk, it is think about the audience. And the great thing is, you know, we, we've already, there's been a lot of citizen science out there. Um, and, you know, more than 300 years, it stretches back. And here you can see Edmund Halley asking for people to observe a solar e eclipse. And what was great was, you know, the eclipse really is a total eclipse. It's one of the big um, events of, that, that you can get people engaged with in science. And in fact, um, the last one, um, 11th of August, 99, in the UK um, proved a really great opportunity for citizen science. So I worked with Chris Scott, who's now at the University of Reading. And you, you know, you can imagine, we're in effect switching off the sun for a few minutes. You can do some very cool things with this. And what we wanted to do was to track the hole in the lower ionosphere, just created when the ionizing radiation from the sun was switched off. And we asked, to, to do this, we got listeners uh, or readers to listen out for the time at which a Spanish radio station, Radio La Coruna, became audible. And we could, we could actually track the size, position, and strength of the weakened ionosphere under the eclipse shadow. And by using their postcodes, we could locate the readers and produce a kind of contour plot. And you know, it was an interesting experiment. Well, I think we managed to conclude that the sun was, was brightening or something like that. And of course, the great thing was it didn't depend on um, there being completely clear conditions because in true um, UK style, it was pretty cloudy day and it was quite difficult, except for seeing a sort of general dimming to see the eclipse. The other great thing about looking back in uh, an ancient citizen science is you can see that it has to be simple. People have to know what you're on about. And this one uh, 1749 experiment just got a sort of whinging Welshman complaining, uh, writing in, and no one actually took part because it was so complicated. Equally, we can see things like the Orderman Society's um, Christmas bird count has just been going, you know, for more than a century because people love. Uh, creature um, sort of counts and so on. Butterfly counts are another great example. And certainly when we launched um, a public appeal for mass experiments with, with the BBC uh, back in the mid nineties, uh, we were hoping that, that um, the public would help give us ideas for experiments to make it really inclusive. And it was called Megalab. And indeed, it did live up to its title. There we all are in the Science Museum to launch it. There's me right at the back uh, in the old launch pad gallery with Carmen Price of Tomorrow's World, the uh, Science Minister of the Day, David Davis, Mark Goodyear of uh, Radio One, and John Durant of the Museum. And of course, one lesson for, for doing uh, mass engagement is to work with um, media organizations. It sounds obvious, but obviously the combination of the BBC and the Daily Telegraph meant we could reach really enormous audiences uh, of, a mil of millions. And not only that, it's more than a platform, it's you're dealing with people who are experts in public engagement. Uh, you know, I'm a professor of public engagement um, science, but I must admit the people who are the real experts are the media, the global advertising and marketing industry who reach billions of people every day. And we put, a, uh, this, as I said, an appeal out for people to come up with their own ideas for experiments, this utopian view of citizen science. And I had to judge the entries with John Burt, who was the director general of BBC at the time. And then the next science minister, which is William Wardergrave. And actually what came out loud and clear was that people don't really have a very clear idea of what's meant by an experiment. And I think what really sticks in my mind was that People just wanted a solution to their pressing problem. And of course, the most pressing problem that most people had was that they had a loved one that was ill or dying of cancer. And could we come up with a mega lab experiment to help them? And it was quite striking that really the, the, the only really workable um, mass experiments we got to engage the public really came from scientists, notably psychologists. So here's the first true mega experiment to engage a big audience. It was conducted with uh, Professor Richard Wiseman of the University of Hertfordshire, 
Uh, we used uh, BBC One's Tomorrow's World, uh, Radio One and the Daily Telegraph to test whether it's easier to detect lies in print, radio or TV. This is in the pre-internet era, so we had to set up special phone lines to get people to ring in and what they thought. And uh, there were a million call attempts. We just couldn't handle the traffic, but we did get uh, data on about 40,000 people. But we reckon about 18 million people read about, saw, uh, or you know, found out something about the experiment. And I think it was one of the largest ever psychology experiments carried out in the UK. As I said, more than I think it was more than 41,000. Uh, Richard got a follow-up letter in Nature. And the nice thing was uh, it had a slightly counterintuitive result because the radio listeners detected the lies 73.4% of the time, newspaper readers 64.2%, and the TV viewers only 51.8%. And it supported the idea that visual clues and cues would actually reduce individuals' ability to detect um, lying. So it was interesting and it was, it was useful. Uh, of course, there is a basic assumption to this, that the public were telling us the truth when they took part in this experiment. But I thought it was a nice example of what a mass engagement experiment can look like. And in fact, we carried on for years doing these experiments in Megalab and then Live Lab. We looked at the differences between the sexes and the experiment with uh, Simon Baron Cohen, which looked at perceptions of emotions. It was interesting when the results came in because they, they were, we got them within minutes on live TV and they were not what Simon was expecting. So I can remember seeing the blood draining from his face as he thought of an explanation for the results. And it seemed to be that the critical factor was something to do with um, direct eye contact, which made it harder to read another's uh, emotions. Um, and surprise, surprise, we didn't find much difference between men and women. And about 126,000 people took part in that. We uh, followed up a study at the University of California, San Diego, on to see whether babies look more like mothers or fathers. And um, uh, lo and behold, they look a bit, um, a bit like mum and a bit like dad. And uh, you know, the moral of that story is don't do experiments that are absolutely obvious. Um, and so the, you know, we did more creature hunts um, for red squirrels. Um, we found that um, another experiment with Richard Wiseman that how we judge people does depend a lot on first impressions. Um, and we also did um, a series of other experiments where we investigated weight loss regimes, uh, got people to fidget, to think thin and so on. And what we found was that the fidgeting group did not do as well as the people who thought themselves thin, which is a bit counterintuitive. But then I did come across this chap, Jim Levine, who devised the experiment, who was very into something called non-exercise activity thermogenesis. He felt that we were, we were not mobile enough in our lives we needed to to move more and I ended up doing an experiment myself at the Daily Telegraph for several months using a treadmill desk which I'm pleased to say worked so well um, even though I was mocked by my entire uh, the entire staff of the Daily Telegraph including Matt the pocket cartoonist who told me that we're laughing so much we're all losing weight Roger I've actually got now a treadmill desk at the Science Museum and um, if you look on Facebook, you'll see my Treadmillerati page where the great and the good of science communication um, have, have given my, um, my, taken my, my treadmill desk for a spin. So let's just move on to web-based experiments. <clears throat> I got really interested in the work of, uh, when I was editing New Scientist, of Adrian Owen, who found a way to communicate with people who were thought to be in a vegetative state by getting them to think about things in, re in re doing certain activities if they wanted to say yes, other activities and they wanted to say no. And Adrian had worked on a series of online cognitive um, tests and mostly to look at the effect of smart drugs, but I realized that it would be, have really interesting potential for doing a mass uh, cognitive um, experiment. We launched this experiment in the uh, in the tele in the in New Scientist, and I must admit I was a bit worried about the response because it took at least half an hour 
to do all these cognitive tests. As it turned out, we got a massive response. And I think because it was an authentic experiment, you could really tell that it was testing a whole suite of cognitive abilities. We got very good data um, on about 44,000 people worldwide. And we published a paper in the journal um, Neuron that challenged the idea that you could boil intelligence down just to one number IQ and just found that short-term memory, reasoning, and a verbal component probably were, were the, the, the minimum parameters you needed to sum up someone's ability. Proved very controversial with um, the psychiatric community, um, but actually Adam Hampshire, who was part of the original team now at Imperial, has done some really interesting follow-up work using machine learning methods um, that really supports this view that cognitive skills depend on shifting complex coalitions of brain networks rather than one area that does one thing. Uh, meanwhile, back at the Science Museum, we have um, offered the museum to a whole range of researchers over the years. I think more than 30 different projects, everything from scanning faces to game theory and so on, uh, where the visitors have been used for experiments, some of that 40 or 50,000 visitors, at the Science and Industry Museum, uh, we, we looked into Alan Turing's predictions uh, about sunflowers and pattern formation, uh, and it led to an interesting paper that showed that there were more complex structures, these Fibonacci structures, um, that had not been previously reported in sunflowers and seed heads and so on, again, which could help hone mathematical models. We did a mass music experiment called Hooked, which got actually a huge uh, response, 175,000 players worldwide. Um, among the kind of things that we discovered was the, um, uh, the what, what's the kind of the catchiest song in the world. And at that time, it was the Spice Girls um, hit Wannabe. And what they, they found was that um, participants could recognize that song in just 2.3 seconds compared with an average of five seconds. But it was more than just a game. It was actually a way to help a team at the universities of um, Amsterdam and Utrecht um, test ideas about music and memory and so on. And just finally, one of the more recent things I've done is on solar storms, uh, where we enlisted people to classify solar flares um, for an exhibition about the sun. And let's just hear my colleague, Harry Cliff, just give you one minute on that, and then it'll be over to the results and then Steve. Our world is under threat from the sun. Our star occasionally sends huge clouds of charged particles hurtling towards the earth. These solar storms have the power to knock out electricity grids, satellite navigation and communication for days, weeks, or even months. The impact on our way of life could be devastating, but you can help. Here at the Science Museum, we've teamed up with scientists from the University of Reading to launch a new citizen science campaign. Taking part in our Zooniverse project, you can help scientists decide which solar storms are the most dangerous and ultimately improve our ability to prepare for a major storm. Your contribution will make a real difference, so click on the link and help protect our planet. So what was great was we got people to classify uh, 1,100 observations of coronal mass ejections taken by NASA's stereo spacecraft. Um, what we found was that solar storms become more complex as the sun's 11-year um, activity cycle reaches its maximum. So it's just another finding that could help improve space weather forecasts. So I've really galloped through a lot of material. I think it's enough about me, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of all the different facets of how we can engage with big audiences. And now let me hand over to my UKRI colleague, Steve Scott, for a little bit more. Over to Steve. Thanks, Roger. And uh, thanks for the invitation to be involved in this event. I'll just uh, share my screen. So bear with me one second. Hopefully you can see those slides all right. 
Um, so yeah, I'm from UK Research Innovation um, and I work within their public engagement team there. Um, and for those of you that maybe are less familiar with uh, UKRI, um, we're the largest public funder of research innovation. We get a budget of about eight billion pounds a year, so a little amount of money. Um, and we bring together um, seven research councils. So we cover an awful lot of different disciplines, right from the arts, humanities, economics, social sciences, right through to the kind of what might be seen to, uh, harder sciences of you know, biology, chemistry, maths, physics, uh, engineering and those sorts of things. Um, so we fund every stage of research from fundamental to applied research. Um, so we've got a huge responsibility to engage different audiences with the work that we do. We, um, we publish a, a, a vision for public engagement um, a couple of years ago. Um, and in that we said, we believe that research innovation should be responsive to the knowledge priorities and values of society and open to participation by people from all backgrounds. Um, and we did have a focus on underrepresented groups. Um, we did want people to be actively involved. We wanted to be nurturing the future generation um, and thinking about their uh, relationship with research innovation. Um, and we wanted to listen to public concerns. Um, but the key thing there is, we're talking about society, we're talking about public, we're talking about communities, but we're talking about reaching everyone. Um, and that's challenging. As Roger has just talked about, you know, the numbers we're talking here are quite tricky. If we want to engage with billions of people, we need to think about audiences as more than just a homogenous general public, but really get under the skin of uh, what their motivations are for being involved. Um, so this is uh, a piece of work that King's College London did with uh, the British Science Association. Uh, and they um, undertook research into how this model maps into the attitudes and behaviours of UK public. So thinking about um, uh, different uh, aspects of society and how they engage with um, science uh, in particular. Um, and it showed that three quarters of the UK population, so that's roughly 49 million people, fall into two categories. They're either not interested because they don't feel like science is for them, um, or they're inactive. So they're interested in science, but they don't make a particular effort to engage with it. Um, so that's you know, a really oversimplification of things. This is a very simple model, um, but people are complex and don't fit neatly into these four categories necessarily. Um, and what we're doing at UKRI is we're trying to explore this much more deeply, um, you know, trying to do our own piece of research to understand more about our broader audiences for public engagement. Who are they? Where are they active? What do they do? When and why might they want to engage with us? Um, how would they want to do it? are some of the questions we we're hoping to unpick in the research that we're doing. Um, but just thinking about that, there's 49 million people who you know, maybe don't feel that research science is of interest to them. So this is a diagram that some of you may be familiar with. It it's kind of gets wheeled out occasionally in, in the public engagement realm about thinking about a spectrum of public engagement where depth of engagement or how meaningful or impactful that engagement is, is pegged against uh, the number of people that take part. And we tend to think about this in terms of, um, you know, some activities are great at reaching a lot of people, but the engagement that those people get with that subject is maybe quite shallow. Um, and then at the other extreme, we've got dialogue activities where, you know, there might be only a handful of people that are involved in that dialogue, but they really get to get into the, the, the deep pickings of that subject area. Um, and so we're going to focus on that top left hand quadrant. Um, but I suppose one of the questions with that is thinking, well, who decides which of these ends of the spectrum is more valuable? You know, is, is that mass comms, gaming, online, citizen science thing less valuable um, because it is more people and shallower than something that's hitting um, that kind of dialogue, co-production end of things? Um, so we believe that we need to act at all scales of the spectrum. Um, to be inclusive and most accessible. People want different things from the research innovation system at different points in their lives. So becoming a lay uh, expert and attending dialogues after a cancer diagnosis, for example, might be something that kind of really piques someone's interest. Um, or, but it might be that, you know, the engagement that someone wants at that moment in time is taking their family to a fun event, get the kids out for the day, um, get them doing some noisy science experiments um, and maybe getting a little bit of education in there at the same time. 
So I suppose thinking about that people, you know, that public, um, people aren't static in that. Um, they're going to move around on that spectrum. And this is some of the work that we're really interested in exploring at UKRI. So we've done some research with Liminal Space, and this showed us the habits of audiences to museums and how they're changing. Um, and they're changing in response to outside factors. So, you know, um, our Museums of the Future showed that things like COVID um, is changing how audiences want to access things. So, you know, they want to access things on a time scale that suits them, not necessarily between nine and five. They might want to, you know, access it at different times in the day, um, but also in a place that suits them. The growth of online engagement activity through the pandemic has been huge. This is a significant opportunity um, for, you know, museums, public engagement to access that those audiences that are interested in engaging content online. Um, so this is really kind of a revolutionary moment um, thinking about museums. The last time mu museums closed their doors uh, was in World War II. So to think about the impact of the pandemic on museums and how they might have to rethink and reshape their work uh, as we move out of the pandemic is really interesting. We've got really important issues that are raised and prominent at the moment. The climate crisis uh, is one of those things that we're often being bombarded with at the moment. COP26 is around the corner. Um, and audiences are demanding more and more information on their terms um, about sustainability um, and their role in climate change. Black Lives Matter. Audiences want our heritage and collections to represent them. They want us to be genuine, honest and to have integrity. So that Black Lives Matter movement is really starting to make people think about what they want to consume um, and, the, and the sorts of topics that they want to explore. Um, so UKRI has created uh, a mindsets programme which is delivered in partnership with the Museums Association and this is funding um, projects in museums um, and helping them to explore some of these topics um, and is using £600,000 awarded to digital innovation and, and engagement excellent in that sector um, and we're looking to to launch some more funding next year to move that work even further. So, and, and, and part of that is experimenting with new ways of funding, awarding organisations well beyond our usual beneficiaries. So reaching out to beyond the usual suspects that we might normally fund. Um, we've also been looking at establishing uh, UKRI's strategy for broadcast and mass engagement. Um, so we did a survey in 2017 uh, of about 3,000 people um, and just before UK was born, this was, and it showed that most people still watch TV for their factual content. That's where they get most of it from. Um, so we're going to take a deep dive into that, um, uh, into audience segments um, over the next few months um, and focus specifically on those who don't believe that r and is for them. So um, maybe think research isn't for them. Um, and we want to explore where they might want to, to get their information. We expect to see social media uh, you know, apps like TikTok and Instagram will be hugely part of that process. Um, we want to explore how we make the most of the moment of activation that follow up. How can we capitalise on those moments of participation and make them meaningful? Um, you know, thinking about um, TV, you know, we often watch an episode of EastEnders or Coronation Street. Um, and there's a thing at the end of the programme saying if you've been affected by any of these issues, um, call this line, look at this website. How can we do that for research and innovation? Um, you know, the Earthshot Prize is another example. They've taken research grants and made them into the Oscars. Is that something we should be doing? Really making the public decide who gets the money. Also thinking about um, gaming. So we commissioned uh, an organisation called OCA to carry out a scoping report into gaming to increase public engagement with climate change, in particular, some of the narratives through COP26. And the report highlighted gaming as a significantly untapped opportunity for public engagement. Um, you know, the numbers of people that engage with this content uh, through, through gaming um, is huge. Um, the OCA's report provided evidence for UKR's leadership as a, a convener for a programme like this. Um, the reach for games is huge, it's a huge opportunity. So later this year, we're, we're commencing a new programme that seeks to use gaming as a method of reaching more people and, and enabling them to engage with uh, research innovation. Um, and Roger's already talked a little bit about citizen science. And, and I suppose one of the things that I just wanted to talk about on this was just to say citizen science is, is not just a kind of flash in the pan gimmicky thing. 
Um, I think the role of citizen science is changing and it's becoming a much more valued and effective way of creating knowledge, empowering the public to decide the questions, upskilling participants in you know, what research means and, and the methods that are used and bringing more importantly, different forms of knowledge, expertise and experience into research. So this is a real valuable way of, of reaching different audiences. And we launched a, re, uh, a funding scheme specifically aimed at citizen science and participatory research projects. Um, and five projects were funded. And just to give you a bit of a flavour of them, to show the different directions citizen science is going. These were three year projects. So they were getting a, a substantial amount of money. Um, but this is really valuable research. Um, so Homes Under the Microscope is a project that brings together a collaboration of citizens, researchers, industry, community groups to investigate the presence of microplastics in the air in the homes. Um, and that's been associated with lung disease. So it's a really important issue, but also microplastics, pollution, um, you know, where do these microplastics come from? You know, the, how do they affect our health? But also what's the source? So this project will work closely with a team of citizen science to not only deliver that research but design and implement it so they're you know they're going to be detecting and monitoring microplastics in their home um, and figuring out the best ways of doing that but then that will enable them to roll it out to a much larger group of people across Bristol and Bradford um, so it's going to be interesting to see what they find out um, but it's not just about that kind of traditional science experiment. Um, it's also thinking about using people's lived experience as well. So um, this project, um, Youth Lives, is based uh, up in Yorkshire and are working with a real range of different groups. Um, but most importantly, empowering people, young people with lived experience of mental health problems to work in partnership with researchers to address the questions that they think are important. So there's a real broad consortium of people that are involved um, to understand what those young people's priorities are for mental health research and to support them to kind of prioritize them but also to support them to design new research that addresses the evidence gaps that they identify and think are really important to address. Um, so it's going to be a really fascinating project. Um, so that's kind of got a PPI, a, a patient public involvement aspect to it. Um, but also this project in Bristol is looking at some really challenging issues within the city. Um, and obviously this involves the University of Bristol, but it also involves some of those grassroots organisations in Bristol that work with black communities like the Black, black Southwest Network um, and Black Artists on the Move. Um, Bristol Archives and the Council are also involved, but this is really going to explore all of these groups coming together to explore the expertise and experience within uh, Bristol itself um, to address the kind of history and contemporary legacies of transatlantic slavery and racism within that city and that's been very prominent in the news over the last 18 months two years nationally but it's been uh, an issue that's been very prevalent and, and important in the city for for decades so having a project where citizens are at the heart of it as equal and active participants in that research process um, will be really interesting to see what the outcomes of that project are so I'll finish there. Um, I suppose just kind of to reiterate some of the things that um, uh, Roger's already said and that I've said in my talk, you know, the public is not a homogenous group. We don't all have the same interests, the same way of engaging things. So it's not a one size fits all. There's lots of different approaches. And I suppose what we're interested in is using innovative approaches, new technologies to reach audiences in exciting ways and, and looking at the blend of different approaches and how they might enable us to, to reach some groups that maybe don't often get opportunities to engage with research, whether that's TV, social media, gaming, or more active participation through citizen science. Um, so I think I'll stop at that point and uh, give you an opportunity to ask us some questions. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Roger and Steve. Um, that was fascinating. I wish I always wish we had some digital applause available to just prove the button and there we go. Hurrah, hurrah, clap, clap, clap. But I'm afraid it might turn out to sound a bit like Richard Osman's House of Games, if you know what I mean, sometimes. Which, <laughs> a more. A bigger applause. Can I ask? I'll ask a question. Seamus prerogative. Um, we've heard a lot about the audience research and how you engage with the audience. I was wondering about if anyone had any views on how the supply side has changed over the past few years. Uh, I get the feeling there's a lot more opportunity for scientists, especially at PhD level, to engage now. I mean, it used to be maybe a decade or two ago, 
you'd have to really have a hard time getting past your prof to actually engage meaningfully with the public where you should be at the bench doing your PhD. But now, I mean, pint of science, I know in Belgium over here, it's, I think it's part of the PhD um, process. You have to actually engage with a public audience to explain what you're doing in your PhD. I just wonder if you have any views on how, how that's changing and how that supply side into public engagement is yeah. happening. Steve, shall I? I'll, I'll jump in first. I mean, I, I agree with you, Tim. I, I think things have really changed. I, I, I think a lot of lip service was played, paid to what was called public understanding of science, which was kind of a patronizing model of these people that are a bit ignorant. We have to educate them. Um, and actually what you found was at that time, I'm talking about the 80s, uh, any scientist who was really successful uh, at this was kind of hated, loathed by their peers. I think things have changed a lot now. I mean, certainly, you know, in the museum front, we, we work a lot with, um, you know, Manchester, with the University of Man Manchester or Salford, with Imperial in London and, and UCO. We get lots of students involved. We've got a technician's gallery we're going to open up where we hope to get technicians uh, involved. Um, and, and the Medical Research Council, we've just done a uh, science writing competition for PhD students where they're going to get the winner gets published in the Observer. So I think there's lots of activity in lots of ways. I'm sure Steve's got plenty more to add. There are Steve, I've queued you up perfect. Oh, perfect, thank start. you. Um, yeah, I, you know this is this is my bread and butter kind of. How how do we create that that culture that um, those conditions that enable researchers to feel that. Um, there they can do public engagement I think like you say historically that's not been the case and I think there's been a huge amount of work particularly in the last 15 years probably to kind of to, to change the culture within research so as those people that that have got that skill and that ability and that desire to go out and engage people with their research more actively um, have got the, the kind of pat on the back that they deserve for doing it, but also it, it's recognized as, as an important part of being a researcher. You know, you wouldn't dream of being a researcher and not publish a paper to communicate the results. So why would you not go out there and talk to the public about it? You know, you're passionate about it, you're excited about it, it's important. So, um, you know, I think oh, yeah. there's lots going on around UKRI, thinking about research culture more broadly, um, but also thinking about the role of, of public engagement in that. We've learned an awful lot in terms of how you create and, and change culture um, to make it much more conducive to enable people to do public engagement. Um, but I think you're right, there's, there's, there is now a much more positive atmosphere than there, there was uh, 20 years ago for people going out and engaging with different audiences. And I also think, you know, the great thing is that we now offer funding to researchers to enable them to do it. So the, the citizen science projects that I talked about earlier, you know, at the heart of them are researchers, but they're working in partnership, in collaboration with the public. You know, it's not that the public are just subjects of their research now. It's really a, a kind of um, equal partnership. And, and one of the things we want to do is try and to encourage that sort of work more and to make sure it is equitable and equal as it goes forward. Um, but there's loads of great work going on. And, and for some, some subjects, it's naturally a, a part of how they work. It's, that's their methodology. I think it's, it's ensuring that those skills are, uh, are shared and, and other subjects learn from that and, and embrace it more. In fact, there's one thing, just one last thought on this, which is, you know, UKRI spending, what is it, seven, eight billion pounds of taxpayers' money. Hopefully it's going to get loads more today, Steve. I'm keeping my fingers crossed for you. Um, you know, there, surely there must be, every researcher who enjoys um, money, in effect, from tax revenue should feel an obligation to explain to the public how they're spending their money and why their research is so important. So I think it's something quite fundamental here we're talking about. Sorry, I'm getting very sort of animated and pontificating a bit, so I will, I'll shut up now, so Tim. Thanks very much, Roger. <laughs> Paul, Paul, have we got any, uh, any what, what questions have we got on the old um, chat? Yes, so we have several. Um, one is Steve in particular which is asking, is the audience for innovation different to that for research? Oh, good question. Um, I, suppose, I suppose this comes back to the, the general point both Roger and I have, have made is that, you know, there's, um, 
I think even within research and within innovation, you're going to have different audiences. And, and for me about public engagement, uh, the first primary thing is what is your reason for engaging with the public? You know, what is what is your purpose? Um, but then who is the right public to be engaging with? Um, and who is the right audience? You know, what is the group that's relevant? So, um, you know, I think I think there's lots of value that the public can bring into innovation and and the way that that works you know there's knowledge and expertise and experience that that the public can bring into that so um i think you know there's always going to be some crossover but uh, i think a lot of it depends on what form of innovation that is yeah i, I think it's really difficult to give you a one size fits all res response to that um i you know certainly um when when i talk to people about um, science writing and, and getting the intro of an article right to engage people and get, get their interest. Um, I do recommend they experiment on their, any long suffering friend who's got no interest in science whatsoever and read out a couple of paragraphs of what they've done. And if they reach for their mobile phone and start fiddling with it, then it, it ain't working. And often it's not so much about the general subject matter, it's about the angle, the treatment, the hook, the way into the subject. Um, if you can get it on the terms of your target audience, that's the, the tricky bit. It's not so much the innate worth of the research, if that makes sense. Great question though. I have a question. Um, so, Raj, you discussed in your presentation how people seemed, during COVID times, people have seemed eager to learn at a deeper level about biology, yeah. about because now PCR and antigen is a word that we all use, and we, yeah, it wasn't the case, of course. Um, do you think that people that engage with the general public in terms of scientific engagement and outreach, um, do you think the learnings that we that we have from this? From, from communicating at a deeper level biology to the general public could be used for something that feels less urgent and feels less impactful, like climate change. Um, I, I think the tricky thing about climate change is, you know, you, you are, it is, it, like, for example, I think, I think we got um, international action on the ozone hole with the Montreal Protocol, even though it's going to take, you know, until 2050 to fix that ozone hole. But because the, um, the consequences were so dramatic and so obvious, um, it's more subtle with climate change. I mean, when I say subtle, I think in the last year or two, um, you know, with strange heat waves in the US Northwest with, with, you know, fires in the Arctic and so on, massive downpours and tube stations flooding. I think actually it is now, um, obvious that something's gone horribly wrong but I, but I think you're you're right that the change it, it, it's it's gone over years it's been more gradual so it's been harder to activate people um but I do think you can't I'm afraid a, a threat to to your your way of life um you can't easily beat um that for focusing people's attention in fact the last time I can remember uh I mean there, there was the earlier uh, bird flu scares but probably the other big one I vividly remember is when BSC um, calls Kreutzfeld Jakob disease. And then actually I could write 2000 words a day on prion proteins for the Telegraph and the news editor wanted more. Um, whereas pre BSC CJD, if Stan Prusner had offered me an exclusive interview, it would have been ended up being like two paragraphs in the paper. So um, yeah, I, I I wish I wish I could say yes, but I, I I'm af I'm afraid there you know, people will be very interested in asteroids when one bearing down uh, on the Earth, um, <laughs> sadly, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Thank you. Do you have any comments, Steve, about about this? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I I um I come from a, a biological background, so um you know that's where my my science was peaked my interest in science was peaked and um yeah it's it's interesting how it focuses your attention but i think one thing it does demonstrate is the importance of having that ongoing conversation with the public about lots of different types of research um and you know so is that when it comes to those important moments where maybe it does come to the fore um people are equipped to be able to jump in and have those conversations and i think um that's maybe much easier when it comes to things like um you know health and people's well-being but um climate change is a is one of those things where it's it's been that conversation has been going on and on for a while 
Um, but now we seem to be in that moment where it's 